Okay, we are back. This is Senate Health and Welfare, and we are looking at S-285 with our Ledge Council, Jennifer Carvey. Um, and then we have some witnesses who are interested in testifying. We're going to ask that any witness who testifies do it as uh, efficiently um, as possible so that we can have some time to uh, really look at the bill in some detail. So Jennifer, thank you for being here. And yes, thank you. Trying to walk us through the, the changes, as I said earlier, uh, a lot of work went on during our town meeting week to bring the committee a bill that reflects the conversation and the testimony that we have heard and to um, and to reflect also input from the folks who have been so engaged in the in the bill earlier. So we'll go right ahead. Great. So Jennifer Carvey, Legislative Council, uh, this is a new draft of S-285. I've shown, uh, uh, I'm showing to you in markup version. So you can see the changes from the previous version are all highlighted. Um, and I tried to do bold for bold highlighted for what's new and um, not bold for what's struck for the most part. Um, and I've provided the source of for these that, that came from external parties um, the source of the recommended change, just for context. So the first section is still 1.4 million appropriated to the Greenland Care Board in FY23 to engage consultants, and this is on the hospital global payment design topic. Um, so to help the board develop a process for establishing and distributing global payments from all payers to Vermont hospitals that will, and now we have a list so it's easier to look at things um, that will help move the hospitals away from a fee-for-service model that is from the previous version uh, that will provide hospitals with predictable sustainable funding that is aligned across multiple payers consistent with the principles set forth in 18 BSA 9371 those are the often called the Act 48 principles that are codified in the Green Act Care Board chapter and those recommendations came from the board and sufficient to enable the hospitals to deliver high quality affordable health care services to patients and that would be based on the actual and necessary costs of providing services not solely on historical charges and that was a recommendation from the healthcare advocate HCAs. so that's the first part of what the consultant would be helping the board do as far as developing a process for global hospital payments also, uh, the consultant would help the board determine how best to incorporate hospital global payments into the board's hospital budget review, its ACO cert certification and budget review, and other regulatory processes. And then this would strike out some language on data collection and uh, per capita benchmarking analysis because that language is, is included in the Budget Adjustment Bill, Budget Adjustment Act. Um, so it was not necessary that the board pointed out that that was already moving. So then we have some new roles for the consultant to help the board with. Um, the next two come from the UVM Health Network. So assess the impact of the board's current regulatory processes, including hospital budget review and certificates of need, on the financial sustainability of Vermont hospitals, and recommend opportunities to improve hospital financial health through the board's regulatory processes. And four is recommend a methodology for determining the allowable rate of growth in Vermont hospital budgets, including using national and regional indicators of growth in the healthcare economy and other appropriate benchmarks. And then finally, um, number five, collab in collaboration with the Director of Healthcare Reform and the Agency of Human Services, identify opportunities to use global payments for providers of community-based services. So not just hospital global payments, but also potentially community-based service provider global payments. So that's the 1.4. And then we would also in here continue to appropriate 600,000 to the board to support the board and the director of healthcare reform in the agency of human services in the design and development of a proposed agreement with CMF, uh, CMMI, uh, sorry, wrong federal agency, to include Medicare in the hospital global payments and to the extent practicable, practicable community-based 
provider global payment, so picking up that concept, as described in subsection A. And then uh, additional language suggested by the board that the board would ensure that any services it procures with these funds are supplemental to and not duplicative of analytics and other support available through AHS. And then you would have a report back. This would move the date from September 1st to November 1st, um, just to try to get a little bit more actually going on beyond just engaging the consultant, but actually getting some somewhere into the workflow. So by November 1st, the board would provide an update on its use of funds to the Health Reform Oversight Committee. And then in January, they would report on their use of funds and the status of their efforts to get Medicare participation in global payments to hospitals and community-based providers to this committee, finance committee, and house health care. So that is the 1.4 and the 600,000, so the first 2 million was section one. Do you want me to stop there for questions? I have one question. I don't know if you can ask, answer this, or maybe one of our witnesses can, okay. but at the bottom of page two, paragraph four, <laughs> recommend a methodology, that paragraph, um, I think maybe this is a witness question. I'm just, why? Um, uh, I'm just curious about what this, how this would work, what the goals are, and why we would use national and regional indicators. So I, I just wanted to put a pin in this. Go to pin, and I think that'll be a Devin Reed question. Yeah. So, so Devin, if you're on, yeah. please address that in here. That's so and if Devin is there, she can. Surely she hears your question now. Yeah. After. Great. Thank okay. you. All right. Okay. Good question. So section two. And the prior version was three million. This would make it 2.5 million, and you'll see where that additional 500,000 comes in in a later section. So this would appropriate 2.5 million to the Green Mountain Care Board in FY23 to engage one or more consultants. And this now is on this delivery system transformation concept. So to engage consultants with expertise in community engagement. That was a recommendation from the board. Uh, so expertise in community engagement with a diverse rural population, that was the recommendation of the healthcare advocate, and in health system design, recommendation from the board. Uh, so I'll stop interrupting that and just tell you now that it says to engage one or more consultants with expertise in community engagement with a diverse rural population and in health system design to assist the board in consultation with the director of healthcare reform and the agency of human services to and then it goes into a lot more detail on the community engagement process so again just to recap the changes here reduce the amount and you'll see the additional amount the additional five hundred thousand come up in section three um, and fleshes out a bit more that the consultants would need to have expertise in community engagement with a diverse rural population and have experience in health system design and there this would all be done in consultation with the director of healthcare reform at ahs and so then the, these consultants would help the board and uh, in consultation with Ms. Christina's position um, to facilitate a patient-focused, community-inclusive redesign of Vermont's healthcare system, this language from the previous bill or version, to reduce inefficiencies, lower costs, improve population health outcomes, and increase access to essential services, including both providing the analytics to support delivery system transformation and leading the, um, and changing the words a little bit, broad-based community engagement process, and provide support and technical assistance to hospitals and communities to facilitate redesign and transformation initiatives. And some of this language is also reflective of some uh, recommendations that the House Health Care Committee had put in their budget memo when they were looking at some of these ideas as well. So. And speaking with the board, there was some thought that some of that language would be useful here. So that the first part of that then is facilitating this redesign and providing support to hospitals and communities afterward. And then it specifies that the community engagement process must uh, inform communities about the current state of healthcare providers in their hospital service area and projected trends. 
engage community members in identifying the unmet healthcare needs in the hospital service area and opportunities to address those needs. And these were both, I think, came from Jessica Holmes' testimony from the board before this committee. Include healthcare professionals at all levels of the healthcare industry workforce. That was a recommendation from the healthcare advocate, including those providing primary care services and provide opportunities for meaningful participation by individual Vermont residents at all stages of the process with outreach to Vermonters who have direct experience with all aspects of Vermont's healthcare system and Vermonters who are diverse with respect to race, income, age, and disability status. And that came from the healthcare advocate's testimony. Then this also directs the Green Mountain Care Board, and this is all new, to use a portion of the funds appropriated in that subsection in collaboration with Blueprint to contract with a current or recently retired primary care provider to assist the board in assessing and strengthening the role of primary care in Vermont's healthcare system and regulatory processes, and to inform the board's redesign efforts from a primary care perspective. Then we again moved out the first report date from September to November 1st. So an update of the use of funds appropriated and that update goes to the Health Reform Oversight Committee and also the January 15th report to this committee, the Finance Committee and House Health Care. Um, and it just takes out some of the description of the process because there's so much more was added in to that session. Section three is a new section, and it was um, the idea to put it as a new section and do it and treat things differently was a recommendation from the Green Mountain Care Board. So that's why their, their um, initials are after the section heading. And this is getting at that idea of data collection and analysis that we had looked at in previous drafts. So in connection, and this one have in connection with the comprehensive update to the statewide health information technology plan that is due to the Green Mountain Care Board by existing statute on or before November 1st of this year, would direct DIVA and AHS to recommend ways to, and then it gets into the language that was in the previous draft about um, enhancing the state's data collection and analysis by connecting clinical and claims data through an enterprise master patient index, EMPI that collects data while preserving and protecting the confidentiality of individually identifiable patient information, including how best to optimize coordination and alignment of the EMPI with VCURES and the Vermont Health Information Exchange, and use data on patient care and outcomes to inform the work of the blueprint in collaboration with the Blueprint Director and the Director of Healthcare Reform, the State Improvement Plan adopted by the Agency of Human Services, and the Interactive Price Transparency Dashboard that the board uh, has been directed to develop for use beginning this year. And then it would, and it would take out this language about detecting potentially avoidable healthcare utilization and low value care because that has also been included in the Budget Adjustment Act. Um, and so, as the board pointed out, it was not necessary here. So we're back to now to the lead in language. So in com connection with the comprehensive update to the HIT plan, DIVA and AHS would recommend ways to, and now number two is collect and analyze data regarding the social determinants of health in consultation with re representatives of the FQHCs as appropriate with an ultimate goal of coordinating that data with the clinical and claims data in the EMPI. And that's based on a recommendation from the consultant to the healthcare task force. So that's uh, Health Systems Transformation, Joshua Slenser. And recommend ways to integrate the EMPI with unique person identifiers in other state agencies and departments. And this had come from Sarah Lindbergh's testimony before this committee, before the break. And she talked about the potential to link some of that data across agencies and departments. Um, she worked with me on some of that language. And then this put on the top of page eight, here's where that other 500,000 from the original $3 million appropriation comes in. The sum of 500,000 is appropriated from the general fund to the Agency of Human Services in FY23 to support the work of AHS and DIVA as that work in that subsection A. 
Uh, you may hear some a different proposal on how to get at some of these same ideas when you hear from Ina Bacchus, the director of healthcare reform. So I'll just put that out there. We didn't have an opportunity to put new language before you today, but she may have some suggestions. Should I wait? I don't know when you want to ask. Um, you want to ask a question about this section? Yeah, I, and, and actually one on the last section. Okay, too. Exactly. No, that's okay, Jack. Yeah. Um, and maybe these are just queuing it up for, oh, wow, now there are a bunch of blocks on the screen uh, for the people who are on the screen. Um, one is the the question, the, the language about primary care. Uh, it's paragraph B at the bottom of page five. And this question is because actually when Jen and I were doing research on a different bill, um, this came up that the Remount Care Board has a primary care advisory committee. And I was just trying to look at, um, try to find out the, the, I can't find it on the website at the moment, but they, and it includes a bunch of primary care physicians and nurses and, and primary care providers. And I'm wondering, are they not using that? And if not, why? And wouldn't that um, meet the needs that this is, uh, is proposing and, and what's going on with that. So I can respond to that, but I can, I'll talk about it later. But well, I'd like to hear from the Green Martin Care Board as to well, why they're not say We can hear from them, but we'll also, there are others who might have a different perspective from Green Martin Care Board on yeah. this. So we should, we should, um, that's a good question. Yep. Yeah. And then my second question is on the bottom of page seven. This integrate the EMPI with unique personal identifiers and other state agencies and departments. <laughs> I, I guess I just want to know more about what that means um, because that sense alone, um, it, it sounds like it could be problematic in terms of it, the way it, for for confidentiality, et cetera. And so, just wanting to understand what exactly that means because it sounds very wonky and raises some red flags <laughs> okay well then we'll hear from folks about yeah. what that means okay okay we are on page eight and the blueprint for health so there's no change to what is now section four adding language to the blueprint statutes to say that the blueprint would include the an initiative um, regarding the use of quality improvement facilitators and other means to support quality improvement activities, including using clinical and claims data to evaluate patient outcomes and promoting best practices regarding patient referrals and care distribution between primary and specialty care. But there would be some changes to the Section 5 report. And this is um, would have on or before September 1st, the director of healthcare reform in AHS recommend to the health reform oversight committee the amounts by which health insurers and Vermont Medicaid should increase the amount of the per person per month payments they make toward the shared costs of operating the blueprint community health teams and quality improvement facilitators with a goal of increasing each plan's or payer's spending on primary care until primary care comprises at least 12% of the plan's or payer's overall annual healthcare spending using the calculations determined by the board and of course with the report that, uh, that came out in 2020 based on the 2019 act. The agency would also provide an estimate of the state funding that would be needed to support the increase for Medicaid both with and without federal financial participation. So this is taking the place of that um, attempt to actually direct a dollar figure increase and appropriate funds. This would instead have them come back with a recommendation on what those amounts should be um, and also incorporates this idea of primary care comprising at least 12% of plan spending. So can you, where, where did that 12% come from? Is it actually in a report about Vermont or is it just in a report about Rhode Island? It, was, it came originally from the Rhode Island, I think the idea of 12% as the figure came from the Rhode Island report and has been carried through in some legislation in Vermont since directing, um, directing a look at what it would take to get provider, to get plans to 12%. So, so do we know where we're at now in Vermont? We know where we were at a couple of years ago, and some of the, I don't, I don't know if there are more updated figures that one of your other witnesses can provide. Yeah, we might hear 
Am I here? Oh, sorry. Right. I think so. I think Medicaid was over 12 percent. Some others were under. Right. And it all depends on how you measure it. So the 12 percent yeah. is basically yeah. bogus. Exactly. <laughs> so, has, so I don't know why we were putting it in statute. <laughs> it's a goal. All right. Then we have on page 10. This is the options for extending moderate need supports. And so there are some changes throughout based on uh, both what you heard from others and in one case, my own change. Um, so this would have Dale can still convene a working group comprising representatives of older Vermonters, home and community based service providers, the Office of the Long Term Care Ombudsman, and take out the Office of the Healthcare Advocate who didn't feel that that was uh, necessarily an appropriate place to be went in. The Agency of Human Services and other interested stakeholders to consider, and the um, the VNAs of Vermont had suggested taking out issues related to and develop recommendations for. So this would just say to consider extending access to long-term home and community-based services and supports to a broader cohort of Vermonters who would benefit from. And then I took out assistance with one or more activities of daily living because the actual language talks about potentially just providing case management, in which case that, that didn't make sense. So who would benefit from them and their family caregivers, including, and then we've got a lot of the same language as was in the prior version, the types of services, such as those addressing activities of daily living, falls prevention, social isolation, medication management, and case management that many older Vermonters need, but for which many older Vermonters may not be financially eligible, eligible or that are not covered under many standard health insurance plans. The most promising opportunities to extend supports to additional Vermonters, such as expanding the use of flexible funding options that enable beneficiaries and their families to manage their own services and caregivers within a defined budget, and allowing case management to be provided to beneficiaries who do not require other services. How to set clinical and financial eligibility criteria for the extended supports, including ways to avoid requiring applicants to spend down their assets to qualify. How to fund the extended supports, including identifying options with the greatest potential for federal financial participation. How to proactively identify the monitors across all payers who have the greatest need for extended supports. How best to support family caregivers, such as through training, respite, home modifications, payments for services, and other methods. And then finally, uh, an addition recommended by the VNAs, the feasibility of extending access to long-term home and community-based services and supports and the impacts on existing services. This would have the uh, department, Dale, collaborate with others in AHS as needed to incorporate the working group's recommendations into the agency's proposals to and negotiations with CMS for, and now we're not aiming for this very next iteration of global commitment, but the one after. Um, so for the iteration of Vermont global commitment, the health section 1115 demonstration that will take effect following the expiration of the demonstration currently under negotiation. So when would that be? Uh, <laughs> later. <laughs> later. <laughs> I'm not sure what the timing is. Um, all right. And then no. by January 15th, and there may be a more elegant way to say that I'm certainly open to the witnesses' recommendations. Um, so on or before January 15th, 2023, the department would report to this committee, appropriations, Senate Appropriations, and the House counterparts regarding the working group's findings and recommendations. And then instead of requiring them to report on the portions that were incorporated into the new global commitment demonstration and the amount of associated funding needs, it would just be an estimate of any funding that would be needed to implement those recommendations. Then we get, we're almost done here, to um, the summaries of the Green Mountain Care Board reports. So the board would be directed still to summarize and synthesize the key findings and recommendations from reports prepared by and for the board including the expenditure analysis and focus studies, taken out the word all that was a recommendation from the board because occasionally they have reports that are extremely technical or very short um, that don't really need to be summarized. They, they either are not um, anything that, the, that anybody would be using for anything other than their own internal purposes or uh, are so short that the summary doesn't make sense. 
All summary, all reports and summaries prepared by the board would be available to, and then this would add, and understandable by the public <laughs> and shall be posted on the board's website. <laughs> <laughs> that was a recommendation from the chair. I, I, yeah. I mean, oh what God. was the public? Like every member of the public. Like, Usually, you know, when a newspaper publishes, they try to publish for, for a third grade reader, but we didn't oh. put that in. I think that's a, I think we're a high bar. Yeah, 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 we're a low bar, depending on which yeah. way you're looking at. It has <laughs> to be understandable by people who don't have English as a primary language, too, which is going to be huge. Well, that has so, to say, so you, may to, to, you may want to think about that. You may want to yeah. have a healthcare advocate who has a lot of experience in trying to make sure the documents are understandable. Yeah. I um, so the act would still take effect on passage, and then I put in a potential name change because the bill currently is an act relating to expanding the blueprint for health and access to home and community-based services. So I changed it to an act relating to healthcare reform initiatives, data collection, and access to home and community-based services. Oh, good title. That's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Jen, thank you. Yes. So just questions of clarification, and then we'll, we'll hear witnesses and be able to ask questions. The first, you know, thank you for the hard work that you did last week. We all worked hard on this one, so we'll see what happens. I know there are a lot of different interests out there, uh, so we're going to try. We've tried in this iteration to put them together, and there will still be comments going forward. We know that. Okay, and. Um, and remember, it's got a really long way to go. Uh, so we're going to we'll turn to witnesses, and, and so you can sit where you, there's a real special. Oh, that's great! I'm going to sit in front. No, I'm gonna... <laughs> I don't think no one's going to be in for a while. So that, okay. And you know, feel free to use a table, or you can you know, move wherever you want. Yeah, you know. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, so thank you all for being with us and listening through the, the bill. Um, it is a new draft. So for some of you, we, we tried to get it out onto the web pages as early as we could and we following protocol. So it's there now for your scrutiny and we appreciate uh, your interest in the bill. Uh, it's an important one to uh, to me in particular, but I think to everyone around the table, you know, as we go forward with healthcare um, reform and improvements for access, um, cost, uh, and quality. So, having said that, Patrick Flood is here, and welcome, Patrick. It's good to see you. And you are muted, but now you should unmute yourself, and we would like to hear your testimony. Can you okay. hear me now? Yes, we can. Terrific. And I, I uh, we'll good morning. Look. Okay, I think we have something. Um, do we have anything from you? No, not yet. Okay. No, you don't. But we will. Get, we will send you um, written testimony uh, after today. Um, I I, I want to say a couple of things by way of introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I worked for 29 years in uh, state government, uh, mostly with AHS. I was the commissioner of Dale for seven years. I was the commissioner of mental health after uh, Irene, and I was the deputy secretary of the agency for four years. After that, I ran uh, an FQHC up in the Northeast Kingdom, and after that, I, I ran for a short while a housing organization in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, I'm here today uh, as a member of a, of a loose coalition of organizations and people that are very committed to healthcare reform. And I'll just say quickly, you know, here, heretofore, we've been, as a group, uh, very concerned about the direction of healthcare reform in Vermont um, and, and opposed to the ACO-based model. But I, I have to say that this bill uh, has changed our feelings about um, the all-payer model and healthcare reform in Vermont. I, I must say that we have not had a chance for me to vet every comment I'm about to make with the entire group, but I feel quite comfortable in saying 
that uh, the members of our group are very excited by the promise of this bill. Uh, this bill to us really sets the stage for significant and very uh, patient-based healthcare that we've been waiting for. So without uh, further ado, I will touch on some points. I have not seen the new version of the bill until just now, uh, but I'll say that what I heard uh, didn't give me any cause for concern. It, it, it sounds like all those changes have actually improved the bill. Uh, and I will have a chance to go through it in more detail, but um, it, it just seems to improve it and make it an even better bill. We do have some concerns that I'd like to uh, bring to the committee. And I know you are probably in a hurry to get your bill uh, passed. But if there's an opportunity to submit language, it sounds like some people did submit uh, suggested language. Uh, we would like to do the same on a couple of the issues. If there's time, I could get that language to you within 24 hours, I'm sure. Um, the first thing is global budgets. Uh, we think global budgets done properly have real uh, promise on a number of fronts to achieve some important goals. We would all agree they could bring stability and predict Ability, uh, to the hospital uh, budgets, uh, but I think they can also do other things that we shouldn't lose sight of. Uh, one is to create flexibility for the hospitals. Um, they, they could actually think differently about how they provide community services and not be uh, beholden solely to what they can bill for. And the other thing is, I think is really important is, I think there can be administrative savings. If, if we do global budgets correctly, then a lot of the billing and the charges and all that that goes on that's so complicated, including some of the negative sides of it, like upcoding, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, can go away. And there, those savings, uh, we believe, should be reinvested in either expanded services or perhaps in helping people cover their copays and deductibles, which you know are very high for a lot of people. We do have one other concern I want to make put on the record, and as I say, we, we are happy to give you some language if you want it. Um, about uh, there should be some form of standardization of charges and rates and billing processes before uh, global budgets are finalized, or otherwise we run the risk of you know baking in some inappropriate uh, processes that are currently in place. Now, I, you, there's language in the bill um, about benchmarking, and maybe that's in, in intended to take care of that issue. Uh, and if it is, that's great. Uh, but I think there's some need for standardization because, as we all know, what gets billed for what is widely different uh, in Vermont hospitals. And I know you had a presentation by the auditor about a reference-based uh, pricing, um, that sort of thing I think needs to be put in place. So that's our major comment about uh, global budgets. I'd also like to take a minute to talk about uh, section three of the bill uh, about, I think it's section three, anyway, um, about the uh, redesign of the delivery system, which I think in the end may be more important uh, than even global budgets, because we need as a system to start paying much more attention to prevention, early intervention, um, to keep people out of the hospital when possible and to prevent more expensive care. I, the bill uses the language of avoidable and low value care. And we think there's quite a bit of that going on. And if we are able to provide the, the necessary services uh, in the community or prior to illness or, or uh, in the early stages of illness, we think we can avoid a lot of unnecessary care and save a lot of money for the system, which then should be reinvested in uh, other services for people. Um, and I, I think it's crucial that the Agency of Human Services and the Green Mountain Care Board work closely together, which it sounds like they are, um, to make that a reality. Because in my experience, all those years at AHS, the, the connection between health, typical healthcare services and human services is often weak. And 
we need to strengthen that and realize how connected they are. I will take just a minute to talk about mental health, which I believe is a linchpin uh, to real health reform. If we, I, I would tell you from my experience that um, an awful lot of physical health and medical health issues are either caused by or exacerbated by mental health issues. And if we don't not only strengthen, but expand our mental health services, we will never get a handle on healthcare costs. Uh, it's that important. Um, so there, I, I would take more time to talk about the importance of, of home health. There's so much more we can do there of, of, the, uh, of hospice. There's so much more we can do there. And I'll, I'll touch in a minute on what we call the dual eligibles. I want to support the, uh, the language in the bill about the blueprint. I, I worked with the blueprint extensively when I was in state government. The blueprint is a great idea. It was a great program. It's been very effective. And I really, I think it's, it's, it's terrific that, that the bill uh, refocuses our efforts and our attention and money on the blueprint. The only comment there is I think it's really important, whatever the rate is, that we're, that the blueprint's going to be able to pay primary care providers be sufficient. Uh, even back in the day, the blueprint asked quite a lot of primary care practices, and the payments the, to the practices really wasn't sufficient to cover what we were asking them to do. Uh, I think the situation's only gotten more complicated, so I, I, it's really important that that, that be addressed and that the bill does that to some degree. What's missing in the bill, uh, I think, is some kind of language about funding all the services that are necessary in the community. I realize what we're doing here is setting up a process for a community engagement, but if we don't have sufficient funding for mental health and home health and the other services, Whatever we put in place is going to fail. Maybe this is not the bill to put that language in there, but I think there should be and could be some direction around funding for those agencies. And the final comment I'll make is on the, the last section that has to do with long-term care. I was very excited to see that. Uh, and I'll tell you that for a number of years, I have felt that our long-term care services um, have, have just not been uh, expanded or improved the way that they should be. I was the commissioner of Dale when we instituted the Choices for Care program and, and negotiated the waiver with uh, CMS at the time. And it that program has done a tremendous amount to keep people out of institutions when they want to be out and save the state a lot of money. But there's much more we can do there, much more. And I think this, the language in the bill sets that up. I, to hear, to see in the bill talk about flexible funding is just really a great because flexible funding is especially important to this population uh, to make sure they get what they need when they need it and keep them out of the hospital and out of the nursing home. And that just brings me quickly to the dually eligibles. Those are the people that are eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. They're uh, usually poor and disabled, and they, and they tend to be the most expensive cohort of our, our whole population. And uh, there's a lot we can do with the duals to reduce costs and improve a care. Uh, there was a dually eligible project at one time with the Agency of Human Services, uh, and it, it folded. Uh, I think it should be reinstituted. I'd be happy to give you some language if, about that very simple language about reinstituting that because the possibilities are huge. Uh, so I, in summary, I would just like to say that I think I speak for the, the group of people I've been working with uh, in general by saying that this is a huge step in the right direction. You know, we really appreciate the work the, com the uh, committee has done. Um, and I think we are setting the stage for really positive, uh, cost-effective, value-based healthcare in Vermont with this process. And, uh, and I want to thank you very much. And again, if there's any uh, room to submit language, um, I'd love the opportunity to do that. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. I appreciate your positive comments on this. It's been a long time coming for some of us, uh, working through HR consultants and working through 
our healthcare access and affordability task force, and then also the work of our other consultants and HROC. So there's a lot of work that's been going on that's been leading to this place. But I think most importantly, as you have acknowledged, the linkage between our community services and our social services with our medical community that we're, we're this is a real, this is a very important direction for all of us. And I very much appreciate your comments. The, uh, it, your, your request to submit language, it would, it would be great. We can't promise anything knowing that the bill has a ways to go, but it would be terrific for you to submit um, the language that you have. You can send it to me and Aaron and, and copy Jen, please. Um, that would be very helpful. And then we'll we'll do, thank you. And we'll look at it, yep, so good. All right, questions, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Patrick. I'm so glad you could be with us today. I have two specific questions, I think, just two, um, uh, about your comments. Um, first, if you have, do you have the bill in front of you, the new version to look at by any chance? Well, I'd have to, I'd have to call it up on my screen. I do okay. have it here. That's uh, okay. I can just ask you. Um, so on the top of page two, there's there was language that was included in this draft that was recommended actually by the healthcare advocate about um, that the payments be based on actual and necessary costs of providing services, not solely on historical charges. That I think was an, a, 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 I don't want to speak for Mike who's sitting behind me. I don't know if you can see him, but, um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think that was an attempt at, at least to get at some of the, the sort of uh, concerns you raised about, you know, not having the payments be based on what was charged in the past, but be pay, based on what is actually the cost of providing the services, sort of like the reference-based pricing, but, um, not tying it to a fee for service kind of language. Um, do you think this is sufficient enough or would you add something to this? And I guess- um, I, well, to answer your question, I, I, I think it's very good language. It, it, it's, it's broad enough that it leaves the door open for some interpretation. I think the people I'm working with would like a little more uh, specific language uh, to make it uh, possible to do more in terms of uh, going along a rate setting line. Now, I know we, we're trying to get away from fee for service, so don't get me wrong there, but I think um, it, we would favor more tighter language that would create, say, more uniformity across hospital billing. So okay. it's it's good, but what I would like to send you would be a little more specific. Well, you can certainly include that in your language. I do want to note, though, that so there are differences between hospitals in terms of what their actual costs are, you know, based on where they are, the region and type of hospital, et cetera. But, um, but sure. I'll look forward to seeing what your language is. And my second question is on page seven. Um, the you mentioned the um, funding for, uh, no, I'm sorry, the avoidable and low cost care. And I just wanted to point out um, that that language in paragraph C was deleted. And I believe, Jen, you said it was because it's somewhere else. Is that in right? I understanding it's in budget adjustment. Yeah. So that language is in the budget adjustment. So I just wanted you to know that. So if you're looking and you see it deleted, you won't say, why did they take that out? Um, Oh. I like that, those scoundrels. Um, so uh, that's, we agree that that's important. It's just already been, it's now law, I think. Well, or it's almost, no, it hasn't been signed yet. <laughs> With the green well, that's level. excellent. When you hear from Robin, she may be able to tell you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and we'll get more information on that later. But um, I think those are my two specifics, but thank you, Patrick, really appreciate it. Okay, any other questions, committee? Okay, good, thank you. Um, thanks again. And we'll, we'll please do send the language along. And there's no promises about how much or what can 
we'll do what we can do. And some of it may be uh, appropriate to another bill. I think you indicated some of that, but we're, we're, we can't do everything in this bill, but we want us to do something and we want to begin the process. So uh, really appreciate your time. Oh yeah, the long-term care stuff. We have another bill on that. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. All right, okay, thank you. So we have Devin Green um, here from Boz. And Devin, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Devin Green from the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Thanks for having me in here today. Um, I want to start off by saying I've talked to the Green Mountain Care Board and the Director of Healthcare Reform. I don't think we're too far off on this bill. Um, and there are just a couple of principles I want to lay out that I'll be talking with them later in terms of any tweaks to the language. But um, before I do that, I wanted to go into a little quick background about where we were and where we are. Um, and I have testimony on the website. It just may need to be refreshed for you to see it. But I wanted yes, to start off. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I just wanted to start off by saying, you know, although healthcare reform has been paused these past two years, um, which is putting it mildly, um, we were at a place where we, we had successes. We had significant savings for Medicare of $122 million. We were reducing hospital stays and lengths of stay. We were reducing specialist visits and there was there were significant decreases in unplanned readmissions. So. I don't want us to come from a place on this of we weren't going in the right direction or the system is utterly broken. Um, I do think and continue to believe that Vermont has a very strong healthcare system. Um, and I think that that was proven as we went into COVID. Uh, hospitals and the state really stepped up. A lot of states, hospitals were not necessarily vaccinating their community or testing their community. They were just doing it for their patients. Hospitals partnered with the state to do that. And COVID really stretched us thin and to the breaking point. Um, I think going into COVID, if you see on the chart in my testimony, you can see our operating margins are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That's all part of um, the hospital budget process. Um, but COVID has really stretched us thin. It has resulted in a lot of um, ripple effects uh, of things that you wouldn't even imagine happening, like gonorrhea and chlamydia test shortages, blood shortages, um, just completely random things that you wouldn't think about. I was on calls with lab directors where they were, um, you know, sending test tubes to each other. Um, so. I think COVID really tested our system. I do want to say we really stepped up, but we are, um, which shows our strength, but we are fragile right now. I think it's exacerbated a lot of problems that we've seen in the past in terms of mental health and also people who are waiting for subacute placement, like long-term care facilities or rehab facilities. Um, and that has just been magnified by 100. On top of that, a lot of our workforce is leaving and we have a workforce crisis, both with people leaving and then also just with our people dealing with our frayed society and patients being frustrated and um, assaults going up and a lot of verbal abuse. So I want to say we've both been strong in our response, but we are feeling fragile um, because of that response. And so I would caution this committee to tread carefully, there's no room for error here. And that is to say that our hospitals want to move forward in healthcare reform, but we also need to be at the table for that discussion. Um, you know, there are, there are processes set up where, um, you know, a consultant comes in and then, you know, provides a plan and then the stakeholders give some feedback, but really it's the plan that goes forward and, you know, who knows how much feedback gets taken into account. And I think hospitals want to be, and, and that is not to say that this is what the Green Mountain Care Board has proposed. I think the Green Mountain Care Board is looking to have a very inclusive process, but I just want to get that 
in the language here. So I want to make sure that hospitals are there at every step of the way, that this is provider and community led and driven um, so that the any consultants who come in or anyone who's making decisions understands the sort of on the ground work that's happening, the details that are happening. We've heard consultants in the past suggest that hospitals should share services or they should um, share surgeons. And a lot of our hospitals are doing that already. And we want to be at the table and say, this is the work that we're already doing. Um, and here are very specific needs because our hospitals vary greatly depending on where they're located or what the community is like or what the community needs. So we really think it's important to have that community and provider input from the very beginning um, before, instead of having a process of having a plan come out and people react to it. So I'm trying to figure out, I think we're getting there. Um, I just wanna make sure that we get that down here on paper. Um, the other pieces, I applaud the director of healthcare reform being more involved. I want this to be a coordinated and a cohesive process. And the director of healthcare reform is the person who does the policy work. And I really would want to make sure um, that the director of healthcare reform is included in this process. Um, I, and again, I think the language is getting here too. I also, under that idea of our hospital system being fragile right, written right now and no room for error. I don't wanna presuppose that the hospital global budget is the way to go. I think we, we can easily presuppose that we're moving from fee for service to value-based care, but if the hospital global budget doesn't work because there's, you know, there are certain situations in that community or we can't get the conditions right or something like that. I want to make sure that things are open to um, other payment models that are value-based. So just wanna make sure that global budgets aren't presupposed because again, I think we need flexibility here going forward just because we don't have any room for error. And um, I also think um, Senator Hardy getting to your question one of the things that we're proposing is this uh, methodology for determining a sustainable rate for hospital budgets. I think this is something the green this is this is this is something the Green Mountain Care Board probably already does, but we are just asking that there be a basis for decisions about hospital budgets so we can see the process and um, have it pointed to. We want to make sure you know inflation's increasing. Um, we want to make sure the Green Mountain Care Board is looking to what things are happening on a national level um, to inform their process. So that's all that is asking for going forward. And with which that, I'm to keep it short. Devin, I'm sorry, which, which of my questions were you just asked? The, the, the national. You went to page two, um, the piece where we recommend we have the Green Mountain Care Board um, recommend a methodology for sustainable rate for hospital budgets and look at benchmarks, national benchmarks and other benchmarks. Uh, paragraph four at the bottom of page two. Yeah. Okay. So can I ask about that? Is, is that all right? Okay. So, thanks, Devin. Um, the, um, the use of national and regional indicators in growth of healthcare economy and other appropriate benchmarks. What what do you have in mind there? What what do you mean, and how is it directly relevant to Vermont? Yeah, I think there's the rate of inflation, um, just being one, um, uh, and and I think that's the biggest one, and also just making sure that the Green Mountain Care Board is taking into account. Um, and are accountable to things that are happen happening nationally and elsewhere that are out of our control. Okay, I guess I I hear you. I get it. I, when I read when I read that paragraph, I didn't know what it was what it meant. And so, if I don't know what it means, I'm concerned about moving forward. <laughs> um, not because I'm special, but because I read these bills all the time. So I guess I would like to include something 
there that says such as the blah, 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 you know, what there's, uh, maybe Nolan can come up with some indicators that would, so that it would be in people on what you're talking about. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So if you have suggestions about what they would be, and it could just be a, a couple examples, like when you mentioned the rate of inflation, there's, I think there's probably a specific regional rate of inflation that's specific to healthcare even. Yeah, um, and we could just indicate there so it would be clearer. Okay, we can do that. Okay, thanks. I guess the most important thing is the degree math. <laughs> okay, and Devin, do you, why don't you complete your testimony and then if you, I think if you do have suggestions, you can send them in. And again, there are no promises here. We're going to move uh, with some uh, efficiency and we want, and there, this bill is, this is this is the first stop for this bill. It is a committee bill, so it will go forward. Yeah, I just to tie it all together again. We're there's no room for error. We have a three million operating margin, which is less than is being um, funded here. So we just want to make sure providers and communities are at the table as we move forward. We want to involve the director of healthcare reform. Um, and we want to provide flexibility uh, to be able to respond if global budgets doesn't look like the way to go and would potentially hurt the system. Well, you know, here the issue that you bring up last around global budgeting is is an important one, but there the bill does land on global budgeting and an assessment of that, and then an evaluation of how it could be put in place. There's no guarantee, as as you well know, that that would be the case. I mean, there's no guarantee that global budgeting will be able to be implemented or taken forward in in, in totality. So, it, it's a good it's a good comment, but I don't know that we can ask the Green Mountain Care Board to evaluate global budgeting as compared with something else. I think we're a step beyond that. So, just that just a comment. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay. One more question. And then Sorry, I know. There's, um, David, I totally hear you about the fragility of the system, the workforce challenges, et cetera, et cetera. Is there something that is, do, is there something you would like to see in the bill that acknowledges that more? Um, or is it just sufficient to say it over and over? And <laughs> I'll hear you. Um, or does the bill do it enough? Um, I think, I think the piece that will be really important is just nailing down the, um, including providers and communities in the process and making sure providers are in the, at the table and, and in the decision-making process instead of just the sounding board. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Senator Cummings. Yeah. I guess I've listened to Patrick and listening to Devin. If we go to global budgets, we, somebody up here in this building, decides how much money you're going to get and you've given up your control to adjust ease. And so our history of adequately funding the services we fund, like mental health, is not good. No. And I understand why the hospitals would be very nervous to give up their ability to handle their own income or in, in yeah. And um, it's not easy. It's not easy. No, it's and not. It, 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 there's a balance yes. there somewhere. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, and I think I mean, it could, it, the devil's in the details with global budgets, right? Like one thing that has come out of the all pair model is that we have liked the, um, the Medicaid payments and the way it's been structure, structured under the all pair model, which is akin to the global budget. And so I do think the idea is worth exploring, but yes, this is why we are uneasy and we want flexibility um because there's not a lot of room for error and so we need to be able to readjust if it if it feels like it's going to impact quality or access for our communities okay senator hooker has a question just a comment i, I mean i just 
you know, I can hear you about the fragility of the hospitals and the need to be careful when we try to implement a global budget. But I just want to remember that, you know, as much as we need hospitals, people need to be able to afford these services. Mm -hmm. And so there's that balance. So when you talk, Devin, about making sure that the providers are at the table, I understand that, but we really have to listen to the community as we see it in Vermont. I mean, regionally it's one thing, nationally is another, but as we see it in Vermont, what are people able to afford to access this, you know, the health care that we have to offer? Um, and certainly I don't want I don't want to see any diminishment in the quality of health care. And I believe we have a good health care system as far as quality goes. But that's something that I think we really have to balance um, between the, the hospitals, the patients, and uh, those of us paying the tax. So, so. Any other questions? <laughs> Just to respond to that. I, I, I think if you could send your testimony, that's helpful. We've gotten into a conversational mode and uh, we don't have, we, we really don't have time to do this right now, but we will return to the bill and you are all welcome to be zoomed in to, to get into the conversation as we look at additional recommendations from folks. So we will be doing that, I think, uh, tomorrow. We'll be back. Uh, make your last comment, Devin, please. Well, turn you. And, and the Director of Healthcare Reform and the Green Mountain Care Board can speak more to this. I do want to manage expectations around affordability. I, I think global budgets are good. It moves things in the right direction. It provides people the right care in the right place and value-based care in general, not just global budgets. I don't know if it's going to save money for people tomorrow. It's the sort of long-term strategy to get people healthier to save money for the all the the whole system. Um, if you look at the Pennsylvania model, which is a global budget model, they're being asked to save 35 million over seven years. You know, we saved 122 million in in two years. The I'm not sure if this is going to get to the immediate savings piece, but I do think value-based care is the right direction for Vermont to be going in. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. That's a good reminder. And what I'm going to suggest is that we move on to uh, Ina Backus, Director of Healthcare Reform Services, and then we'll um, go to Rebecca Copans and Mary Kate Molman. But Ina, thank you for being here. Uh, let me ask a question. I have a question to ask of Robin. Robin Lunch, are, are you intending to testify or are you here uh, to respond to questions? I am here to respond to questions. I have a few comments about the new version, but I can be pretty short and sweet. Okay, so we'll get we'll, <laughs> Good. Thank you. That's what I mean by efficient. That's great. All right. So, Ina, thanks for being here. Thank you. For the record, Ina Backus, Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services. Uh, we, we appreciate the work of the committee in this updated version of S-285, which is um, moving to acknowledge the importance of including community-based providers in healthcare system redesign. Over the last two years, the state of Vermont and AHS have been partnering with providers across the healthcare system to respond and adapt to the unprecedented global health pandemic. As you know, we are very proud of the ways that we've come together across the system to ensure that uh, care is available for those who are sick, including those with COVID-19, establishing a statewide network of testing centers, providing large scale vaccination opportunities and much, much more. And Vermont has one of the lowest rates of death due to COVID-19 in the country. And we owe this uh, to this spirit of collaboration across the system. We can see clearly some of the ways now that uh, COVID-19 has changed the healthcare landscape in Vermont and the country. Uh, two key examples of these changes are we recognize clearly that one of the non-COVID risks of the pandemic has been delays in preventive care and treatment. 
And we see now that people are arriving in the healthcare system with more acute need for care because of these delays in preventive care. Workforce shortages also have stemmed from the pandemic and are particularly acute in health and human services systems. And there is no substitute here for the human beings who are essential as caregivers uh, in our system. As we turn to recovery and revitalization after these two years of COVID-19, we are implementing a workforce development strategic plan, and we're investing in short, mid, and longer term strategies to address significant workforce challenges in the health and human services system. Similar, similarly, our approach to healthcare reform uh, necessarily must be informed by the impact of COVID-19 on the system of care. So I want to take this opportunity to expand on the concerns we previously articulated about how the bill as written is providing uh, some significant resources and support for hospital global payments when it's also essential that any system redesign and subsequent proposal for an all-payer model include accountability for total cost of care and not only the care and services delivered by hospitals, particularly in this environment where we know how important uh, preventive and upstream services are, as well as those services delivered by hospitals. We've been clear that the predictable and prospective payment models that Medicaid put in place prior to the pandemic have created some stability during the pandemic. When visits to health and human services providers sharply declined in the early days of the pandemic, uh, the fee-for-service revenue that was generated by these visits fell away. For those providers who were participating in these predictable prospective payment models, that steady Medicaid revenue provided some stability during this challenging time. So we are fully in support of exploring hospital global payments because this model, depending on its design, can provide for the predictability and stability in the system and also provides incentives to redesign care and again, to support upstream strategies that impact health and well being and move toward value-based care. But I want to be very clear that hospital global payments in isolation can have unintended consequences. Hospital global payments alone can result in inappropriate shifting of hospital-based services to outpatient settings that are not covered by the global budget. For example, discharging patients to another care setting before it is clinically appropriate so that uh, more dollars are available within the global budget and are not a cost to the system. Furthermore, in Vermont, where patients travel frequently between hospital service areas to access care, a system of global hospital payments in isolation would require a complicated and frequent recalibration of these budgets. So for these reasons, I, I really urge the committee to consider that uh, support not only be provided for the hospital global payment design, but also for the design of a total cost of care accountability structure that includes healthcare expenditures beyond hospital only services. As we explore a next potential agreement with Medicare to participate in an all payer approach in Vermont, we need to ensure that we're using our resources to explore not just hospital global payments, but also the potential for broader global budgets, inclusive of community-based providers. And again, that our plan includes a strategy for total cost of care accountability, and that this plan incentivizes the healthcare continuum to work collaboratively across service types to deliver high quality care in the least cost, most appropriate settings. Vermont's all payer model agreement today includes accountability for the total cost of care and services, both hospital and non-hospital services. And as we consider a global hospital payment model, we need to consider, an, again, a total cost of care accountability overlay that would work with a potential new payment model for hospitals. 
Maryland is another state, and you're very familiar, that has implemented hospital global payments, and it too has a total cost of care accountability model that works in companion with the hospital global payments. This total cost of care overlay in Maryland creates the incentives for care to be delivered in the most appropriate settings and to ensure that care is not withheld if hospital global payment um, were operating in isolation. As the Director of Healthcare Reform, I and the Agency of Human Services must approach healthcare reform through the lens of the full care continuum, both upstream and downstream, not just from the perspective of hospitals. If resources are provided to inform Vermont's future healthcare reform direction, these resources should steer towards a comprehensive plan for reform, inclusive of this total cost of care approach uh, rather than an approach that is siloed to hospitals alone. As you know, in my position, I'm also required to coordinate healthcare reform initiatives across state government and with the Green Mountain Care Board. And when it comes to exploring these frameworks for a potential next agreement with the federal government, the responsibility to coordinate between the Green Mountain Care Board and others um, to ensure a plan um, rests with the Director of Healthcare Reform. I think um, further the Green Mountain Care Board would agree that their purview doesn't extend across the full continuum of health and human services care. Uh, and yet these providers do need to work together across settings, particularly as we seek to redesign care in a way that is successful, in a way that um, does provide for more flexibility and more support both upstream and downstream of hospitals. Um, certainly the director of healthcare reform is ideally situated to uh, support coordination in this regard. And in particular, the Blueprint for Health patient-centered medical home, home program is an essential component of our health care system today, is certainly essential as we consider a system that is moving uh, more so towards value-based payment that will rely on the integration of a strong primary care system with mental health and substance use disorder services, for example. Um, and in, in, in the role, the Director of Healthcare Reform, along with the Blueprint for Health, um, certainly want and urge the committee to in, incorporate considerations around our existing uh, primary care infrastructure and its importance um, as we consider healthcare system redesign. And finally, as um, indicated when uh, Jen was presenting on the uh, changes to the bill, uh, I am also the chair of the Health Information Exchange uh, Steering Committee, the HIE Steering Committee. And I would like to propose an alternative approach um, for the committee to consider in terms of harnessing claims, clinical and social determinants of health data. Uh, this approach would support the steering committee's ongoing work uh, to promote a one health record for each person. Um, the steering committee has made progress on this path in recent years. Uh, the steering committee um, has, is working along this path, has a strategic plan to support this path, and has embarked on and tested the integration of Medicaid claims data with clinical data already in the HIE. And because we have established tools within the HIE to provide for this integrated and longitudinal record, we think that the creation of an enterprise master person index may be duplicative with, with tools and strategies that already exist um, for better integrating and linking data. And so we would recommend that the healthcare, if the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee continue its work to cre create one health record for each person that integrates data types to include healthcare claims and clinical mental health and substance use disorder services data and social determinants of health data 
and specifically in furtherance of these goals that the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee uh, include a data strategy in its 2023 Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan update, which would emphasize uh, merging claims data in the Vermont Healthcare Uniform Reporting and Evaluation System, VCURES, with the clinical data in the HIE. And with that, I will close my testimony and thank the committee um, for your continued interest from hearing from me and the opportunity to provide this additional testimony relative to this bill. Oh, you know, thank you so much. And uh, we don't have your comments yet, but if you could send those along. And I know that you sent recommended uh, some suggestions for language. So if you could also get that to us, that would be great. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. So if it's a question of clarification, we'll do it. Go ahead. Okay, I just, I know. It's I think you're sending this anyway, Ina, but what you just covered with the technology stuff yeah. was hard to follow for those of us who are not in the weeds. So I, I'm assuming you sent that to Jen so we can take a look at it or or no, Jen's no, shaking yeah, her head. No. You will, okay, great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'll get that. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it is, I did talk with Ina about the HIE executive uh, group and um, it, it does make some sense. Yeah, it sounds reasonable, but it also sounds technical and difficult to follow, so. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's move on to Mary Kay Molman and then uh, uh, Rebecca Copans and uh, we may go over a little bit, but we, we can't really go over because we're going to lose our ledge council and she's critical to our working on the bill. So Mary Kate, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, for the record, Mary Kate Mullman. I'm the director of Vermont Public Policy for Bi-State Primary Care Association. And I will be presenting our um, members views on 285 um, going forward. I just I first want to thank the committee for addressing these issues. These are some really tough, thorny issues to work through. So, you know, props to the committee to working on it. Um, I'll start. I know we've heard from a number of our witnesses today. Um, we're coming out of a once in a century pandemic. <laughs> um, we're, and our providers are exhausted. I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that part. <laughs> I think they are, but I think you are, but. Um, and I will also call out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all exhausted. Um, and I also want to call out that we're still trying to wrap our minds around the full impact of such significant disruption. What's the impact of the delayed care on health and health services utilization? Are we going to see an uptick in the, in the need and, and if you would give care? Um, what modes of care will need to continue or want to be continued and which will revert to a pre-pandemic model? Um, so that's, I just want to, that's, that's the context we're working in should, and should be part of the considerations as we go through this. Uh, I, I want to echo Devin's comments on providers really need to be part of the decision-making process um, around this work. This, this is a pretty significant shift to our system. Um, some might even go so far as seismic shift. Uh, and so we really need to understand what is feasible to op, um, put into operation. Um, and, you know, why are, why are primary care FQHCs uh, interested in this? Well, a global budget for a hospital requires a strong system, both for the upstream care so that we can reduce potentially avoidable needs and the downstream care so that we have a place to move patients out of the hospital once they are ready to be discharged. And right now that's, we, we don't have those pieces in place and that could actually hurt our hospitals if, if we can't move patients um, where they need to go. Uh, I want to applaud uh, the director of healthcare's call for looking at the total cost of care outside of a hospital. But um, in this, I'm speaking to the specific global budgets for community providers language. Um, I would call out that that language really needs to be focused more on specific payment models need to be appropriate to the type of provider. And I want to call out, for example, FQHCs. We have very clear federal requirements for alternative payment models, and that needs to be part of the conversation. FQHC budgets also defend, uh, depend on federal programs. I'm thinking of the 330B 
a 340B um, prescription drug program and then the 330 grants that they receive. Um, we also have our operations are heavily regulated by a federal organization, FERSA. So the, the, like how all those pieces fit into thinking in a systemic way around global budgets really needs to be part of the conversation. Um, on this issue, we are in the process of reaching out to the Maryland Primary Care Association. Um, this is to understand really how the FQHCs are participating in Maryland's total cost of care model. And I think that would be really helpful as we move forward. I would echo Devin's comments on the increased role of the Director of Healthcare Reform, uh, especially with the need to focus on the next uh, federal agreement, uh, Medicare's role and the th uh, framework through which payment models will be implemented really needs to be understood before we wrap our arms around the uh, significant shift in how we develop and strengthen our healthcare system. Um, we heard questions earlier on um, the primary care advisory group for Green Mountain Care Board. And I just want to touch briefly on that because um, I'd say we, we the idea of having a primary care presence with the Green Mountain Care Board um, is it gives that person much more, more access to data and information that the PCAG does not have access to. Uh, and the PCAG, they, they are an amazing, they provide an amazingly rich conversation and advice and, and a perspective on primary care. But I think having someone who is more regularly immersed in the conversations, has access to the data and information is valuable. Um, going on to the section on the uh, data and social determinants data, uh, federally qualified health centers are mentioned there. And I want to echo Ina's comment about the work that's already happening in the HIE steering committee with the data strategy and data governance um, and the role of the state's data chief data officer. Um, some, oh, I, Senator Hardy, you uh, mentioned kind of concerns around um, bringing all of that data together. And I, I completely agree that is something that we need to be very careful with. Public trust in how we are using data is essential. Uh, however, I would also call that we weigh what is the risk of not bringing that data together? What are we missing by not understanding um, different elements of a, of a person's care and services that they're, they're getting? And uh, and, and that can be detrimental to the individual. And there are a lot of states that are working on this. And so I think following um, their lead, learning from their lessons, those are important pieces. And the HIE steering committee has got this. They're, they're working on it. Um, so that's kind of my comments on the global budget portions of the bill. I just want to turn to the sections on the blueprint for health. Uh, we support increased funding to community health teams and quality improvement facilitators. Uh, the community health teams are critical to our members, patients. Um, they really build on the FQHC's model of integrated whole person care and the ability for someone to go into their primary care, um, flag a mental health concern, and then being able to walk down the hall and talk to um, a community health mental health provider is is really important, or nutrition, or social services, whatever is needed. That's it's really important for bridging those connections. Um, the quality improvement facilitators. These were previously known as practice facilitators, and they originally had a role in the blueprint on preparing practices for the transition and um, preparation for becoming patient-centered medical home recognition. And then they continued to go work with on ongoing quality improvement initiatives. As we start looking, increasingly looking to shifting to value-based care, practices are going to need this additional facilitated support to make those clinical uh, transformations so that they can align their model of care and really optimize how the payment is coming in when it's coming in differently. But in having that facilitated support is really helpful to our members. I hear our medical directors saying, hey, you know, I understand the financial side, but how does that impact how I give care to my patients? And I think having that external voice is really, and supporting our practices do that is really important. Um, and I would say that the clinical, uh, the 
quality improvement facilitators, they're payer agnostic. And I think that's one of the enduring strengths of the Blueprint program is that these individuals can come in and help a practice make this clinical transformation and implement a new uh, care model for all of their patients, not having to segment it out by payer population. So that would be a voice for why the clinical facilitators are so, um, or the quality improvement facilitators have such a large, important role. And that's what I had. I tried to pivot a little bit given the new draft of the bill, but I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is helpful. And if you could send your testimony, that would be terrific. Because you mm -hmm. have any comments that would um, uh, uh, support some of the language changes others have made and perhaps some language changes that you uh, might include. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that's great. Um, I think we're going to keep moving along unless it's a question of uh, clarification or any additional. I just make one quick yeah. comment. Uh, so Mary Kate, uh, the the language on the bottom of page seven that you were, ex it's not it's not that I have concerns about the broader thing. This language is so wonky that it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. So I think Ina was going to send in other language in this whole area. So maybe. Perfect. You know, if you're listening, if you can make it less wonky. <laughs> it's data. <laughs> I, know, I get it. I get it. But, you know, we have to understand what we're saying yeah. here. And it's, it's oh, really absolutely. just from the perspective of somebody who's not in the weeds as much as you all are. And we are sometimes it really it doesn't make sense the way it's written. <laughs> no, that, that makes a good call. I just wanted to call out a couple things about that. Yeah. Any yeah. Questions? We good? Sure. All right. I think it reads great. <laughs> but you're a <laughs> Okay. No, if, if we if we have to adhere to the rule at the end of the bill where it says make things understandable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to practice okay. what we preach. <laughs> so, um, Mary Kate, thank you, and we'll we would look forward to your uh, written information. Uh, Rebecca, thank you for being patient with us, and uh, we're glad that you're here. So we welcome your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Rebecca Copans with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and my testimony is, flipped, is focused on the flip side of this bill, um, the Blueprint for Health Supportive Care Coordination and other programs within our healthcare system. Uh, while it was a novel approach 14 years ago, these programs have failed to integrate value-based payments and other reform efforts. And it continues to lack detailed reporting to ensure transparency and the ability to accurately measure quality outcomes. We appreciate the language in the, in the newest draft and fully support a study that would take a deep dive into recommendations for evaluation, reporting, and targeted efforts at an individual level. Since its inception, our members have invested over $67 million into the blueprint. This is a massive amount of funding for a program that cannot provide patient level reporting data. The blueprint has devolved into a narrowly funded program. Originally, a number of self-funded self -funded employers voluntarily participated, but there's been a continued exodus due to the lack of quality reporting and clarity of outcomes, which has left only six self-funded Blue Cross con uh, customers contributing. The future of the all pair model is tenuous at best, and now reform planning is turning toward global hospital budgets, which, if done in a thoughtful way, has great, great potential for stability for both Vermonters and the hospital system. It must be done with a keen eye on community engagement, and we must ensure that those who are footing the bill, the small and large employers, and regular Vermonters have a prominent seat at the table. There are people like um, Paul Costello who have spent a year engaging with Vermont communities, and they're a career engaging with the Vermont communities. And they're really good at bringing people together to have difficult conversations and engaging folks who may not attend or feel comfortable speaking up at a board style meeting. And there are other people who are really excellent at health systems like Donna Kinzer or Josh Schlen. And I would encourage that the committee um, really delineate between those two expertise by stipulating that a one size fits all consultant doesn't work for this project. With this and all of the policy proposals that you're considering, Please remember the Vermonters who are paying the bill. If you haven't ever attended a public hearing during the Green Mountain Care Board's rate review process, 
I can tell you that the stories are consistent in their message. Vermonters are angry and they are all asking why their premiums are going up year over year. Collectively, every policy change we make must balance both choice and cost for Vermonters. We need to take into consideration the full spectrum of income, health status, and their access to care statewide. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we do have your comments uh, in writing and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, so thank you for your comments. And I see that Robin Lunge of Fremont Care Board has turned herself on. So before we get to you, Robin, questions for Rebecca. I'm sorry. <laughs> Rebecca, um, your, your, I totally appreciate your comment about the, the consultant issue, and I've been trying to figure out how do we embed that in the bill, because I think you're right. If we get the wrong consultant, it will never work. Um, but how do we, do you have suggested language to say how do we get a mix of, you know, Donna Kinzer and Paul Costello, you know, like merge them together and that kind of thing? Do you, that would be helpful. I think, I think you need to say instead of just one or more, it should be, it should delineate the two. Um, I mean, because speaking as, you know, I'm a, I'm a communications person and so often people put, you know, in a one communications role, they do like graphic design and communications. Those are two different people and two different roles. And it's wishful thinking to have, you know, one person be expert at both. And I think it's the same for this, um, this. I mean, there's, there are people that are really good at health, health systems and there are people that are really good at community, at community involvement. And those are generally, I've, I've not met the person that's the same. Right. Those, those two roles. I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that we drop and lunge way in because it looks like she's interested in responding to that question. It might be helpful. So, Robin, welcome. Sure, and certainly. We uh, the, our intent. For the, record, Rebecca, for, Rebecca, for the record, you are. Sorry, for the record, Robin Lunge, member of Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, I couldn't agree with Rebecca's comment more. I think we were intending that by using the term. Uh, one or more consultants, that it would be a team of people with different skill sets and happy to kind of take another look and see if we can make that clearer. Um, because uh, those are two different skill sets. And uh, that's why a team approach would be necessary to get the right expertise. So will you be setting us a suggestion for approving that language? Sure. Uh, given the time, what I was going to suggest, uh, Senator Lyons, if this is amenable, to, if the committee is amenable to this, is that um, after today, this afternoon's Green Mountain Care Board meeting, I am available to meet with people and work through language suggestions um, and try and get back to the committee and Jen later tonight with uh, to work through some of the issues. Um, Devin and I briefly met this morning. We're going to meet this afternoon. Uh, I reached out to Mike Fisher. He is available, but certainly anyone who uh, wants to work with me on sections one and two, so the hospital sustainability sections, um, I'm happy to do that and try and uh, work through some of that process outside of your room, if that would be helpful. Well, that would be terrific. This is a, the hallway conversation that is very useful. And um, so what I'm going to suggest is that you work with those folks. I, they, people are sending stuff into Jen and to me and to the committee. And I'm going to, I'm, to, to keep, I'm going to suggest that we keep the committee out of that discussion that you're having with others and uh, get, get your comments and recommendations to us. And then um, we'll see where we go from there. Tomorrow morning, we will have an opportunity to look at everything and make, do some markup. Uh, on the bill based on what we're seeing and hearing. It's, uh, you know, this is, this is the, this is where we're actually getting the sausage made. So it's great. Uh, I appreciate uh, that. So Senator Hardy, go ahead. Just one quick question on page five, Robin. Yes. The, um, I wrote in the margins, um, it would be great to actually use the words listen and hear um, because engage and inform sound, uh, especially inform, it just sounds like you're going to be talking at people and saying this is what the healthcare system is. And I would really like to hear from people what they think the healthcare system is and how it's working from for them. So listen in here, what's working, what's not working, what's needed, and what and, and 
and what's missing um, and 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 so uh, and maybe find another word for inform because that sounds very top downy. But I look forward to hearing what you, I look forward to hearing what you guys come up with. Great. So Thank I, you. I guess let's let's defend the word inform because sometimes when you have these public gatherings, they need to hear information before they start. But it is I agree with yeah. you. The listening is really critical. All right. Any other comments, uh, Robin, that you'd like to make about the bill at this point? Um, I think most of them I can work through with the folks that um, suggested them. The one thing I would suggest um, is in relationship to the work of the HIE steering committee, um, there is a section which would add a change to VCURES to allow that data to be combined with clinical. Right now, there's a statutory prohibition that gets in the way of that. Um, that change is in S-164, so we would uh, ask that perhaps you add um, that VCURES change so that we can proceed with that work, I'm happy to talk more about that tomorrow because um, yeah, I know that's important. I know that's a bill that we didn't have time to take up. So yep. what I'm, I'm going to suggest that you include that language and as you send along recommendations to Jen, to me, and to others. So that's good. Sorry. That sounds terrific. Um, and then lastly, I would I just wanted to mention that when we were here before town meeting week, we did provide two summaries as examples to the committee of how we were uh, approaching those. We'd ha be happy to get some feedback, um, particularly in, in terms of whether or not you think they're understandable by the public. That would be very helpful to make sure we're on the right track. All right, thank you. Okay, terrific. Thank you everyone for um, help informing us today. <laughs> we have been listening. So, uh, <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna take a four minute break. Thank you. Uh, well, our committee needs a little break, and then we're gonna come back to uh, 195 and 190.